Well, this weekend, I'm doing a living history event. And today on the Deerskin Diary, I wanna show you how I prepare for these immersion style living history events. The equipment that I take, the clothing that I choose, and most importantly, the mindset. So stick around. I don't think you're gonna to wanna to miss this one. Now my goal here is to be very selective in the terminology that I use. My goal in making these videos is to try and make you better with what you have and maybe uh, spawn some interest in um, finding something that you're interested in improving in and being a part of that journey with you. I like to use the terminology how I and I replace the phrase how to with how I because I certainly don't have all the answers and I'm interested in other people getting out there and finding their own answers and, and having maybe the next big breakthrough. So this is a how I, not a how to. The confidence that I get from using my equipment in a way that I know it was used then and being able to replicate the, those old skills and having some degree of success, these little aha moments for me, that really helps increase my um, comfort level with this older style equipment. But more importantly, as I reach each new threshold in the use of that equipment, my experience becomes more authentic, but the experience for the people around me becomes more authentic as well. I don't look like I'm trying to make a home here at this living history, I look like I am at home. Now your mindset and mentality is so important for an event like this. Creating your own small expectations and goals prior to arriving at the event becomes vital towards receiving the best experience that you can. This is such an excellent way for me to test my gear, for me to test my own skills and it really helps provide that rich experience that I'm looking for. So one of the things that I look for at these immersive uh, style events where we're really trying to make that 18th century experience ring true are what I call vignettes. They're these small moments where it looks exactly how I think it must have looked back then. As an example, one time I was at Historic Martin Station and I was talking to a group of school kids there uh, in, in the inside of the fort. And there were three or four native reenactors, uh, some friends of mine that came into the main gates of the fort. And as they approached, I had this moment where I looked at them and said, you know what, that's exactly what that must have looked like then and how strange it must have been for a brand new colonial settler or someone who had never experienced uh, Native American culture and the clothing and the paint and all those things, to see them walk in like that for the first time must have been just, just truly, truly spectacular experience. And in that small moment, I recognized that that is as close as I will probably ever see to what that would have looked like back then. And those are the moments that I am seeking and those are the moments that I'm hoping that I might provide for someone else. Food selection is exceptionally important in an event like this. Everything has to be shelf stable and it has to remain shelf stable for the duration of the event. We all have jobs and lives that we have to get back to when the event is over and no one needs a bad case of food poisoning or another type of illness related to the food that they chose to carry. I'm a pretty avid meat eater myself and so selecting the right type of protein for an event like this, especially when it's September and the temperatures are in the low 80s, is kind of difficult at times, right? For something that was so common, meaning preserved meat products, in the 18th century, they can be rather challenging to find today. One of the things that I look for are manufacturers that make products that don't have to be refrigerated and are advertised as, as such. So that means that they have bacons and hams and things that are cured that don't have to go into the refrigerator uh, later on. So one of the things that I have here is this cured uh, piece of beef, right? So this is cured with salt and nitrites, and then it's smoked over a fire. It's pretty dense. Uh, I believe I got this from George's Brand Meats. Uh, I found it online. 
Again, I'm not sponsored by anybody. This is just a, a place that I oftentimes will go back to to get uh, historically correct meat cuts like this that can survive for a few days, certainly without refrigeration. I try to look for root vegetables that would be common at this time of year. So uh, it's nice that being in the late summer in the south, um, there's a, there are a variety of vegetables that would be um, being harvested at this time. And there are a variety of documented vegetables to the frontier that I can bring with me that just kind of supplement that meat diet, if you will. So I've got an onion here. I've got some carrots. I've got some small apples. There are so many varieties of apples that we've lost throughout the centuries. But one of the more common uh, themes that seem to be uh, apples that are not necessarily purchased from the big box stores. In other words, apples that you pick from an actual apple tree tend to be smaller. And so I look for these smaller varieties of apple. Again, it's the experience for me, but it's also as I eat it, the experience for everyone else around me. Now, speaking of carrying all this stuff, I do that in a market wallet. And this is kind of like the, the plastic Walmart bag of the 18th century. They're made of linen typically. They have a, a, an opening here in the middle and there's two pouches on either side and they hold an amazing amount of food, equipment, whatever else. And I carry this market wallet for my foods particularly so I always know that that stuff is in one spot and I can grab one bag when it's time to start cooking or eating. So when selecting my clothing for the weekend, one of the things that I've done is to look at Doddridge's quote. Now I talked about uh, this in a scouting video earlier, and I'll put a link there at the end of this video to that one if you haven't seen it yet. But I used Doddridge's quote, and I've selected a hunting shirt, a body shirt, a, uh, a, a broad brimmed hat, a pair of trousers and moccasins, and that'll be my standard dress for the weekend. Uh, all those pieces of clothing were selected for both their authenticity here on the frontier as well as their effective uh, their usefulness if you will in this particular ambient temperature so it is september um, it is about 80 to 85 degrees out here in the daytime it's getting down to the upper 50s and low 60s at night so i've selected a lighter linen for the trousers for example um, so this is going to be uh, not only historically accurate but it will also be uh, appropriate for the weather that I should be encountering. For staying warm and dry, I use a two blanket system. And that idea came to me from uh, Nathan Kobuk. And anyone who has ever studied ancient cultures and even some cultures today, like the Bedouins in the Middle East, know that wool has been a tent material or a material used to turn rain and wind. For, for centuries and it was no different in the 18th century so in today's society we oftentimes have a piece of specialty equipment for nearly everything and that is in stark contrast to what was common in the 18th century. There was a lot of reutilization of materials and a lot of things that were used for a couple of different tasks. For example, using a blanket potentially as a tent. Um, and I think that goal, that, 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 that is what I am trying to um, chase here a little bit. At my house right now, I can think of, I think, three toasters, right? I have the big oven that I can use as a toaster. We have a small, older style toaster, and we even have a toaster that uh, burns the Batman symbol on the side of our bread. So we literally have specialty equipment for so many things today. And, and one of the scarier aspects about preparing for an event where everything you will need has to be on your back is getting away from the mentality that I can just simply go to a cupboard or a cabinet 
and, and get that piece of specialty equipment out to make my life that much easier. It is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable that are exactly the moments that I'm looking for. So I want to take a few minutes to talk about the sustainment kit um, that I carry. The stuff that I keep in my knapsack. The stuff that's good for long-term survival, if you will. Um, of course, we got to start with the fire kit. You've seen these couple of uh, pieces of equipment in one of my other videos. This is my moccasin repair kit. It's just rolled up in a simple piece of linen. And inside are some additional pieces of brain tan buckskin and all. Um, a pair of scissors and in the moccasin repair kit are some extra of these um, long strips of brain tan. They're like strings or thread. And what I'll do is chew on the end a little bit and twist it into uh, a point. And with the awl, um, I can poke a hole in a piece of leather and repair a moccasin or in this case, make a new moccasin. Got an extra pair of moccasins here. Uh, as well and these are extremely handy to have I can swap out the ones that I'm wearing for these and of course I have that other pair that I'm still working on rope anyone who spent a lot of time out in the woods knows that string cordage and rope are vital to being able to do things like put up shelters or even just hang equipment up and keep it off the wet damp ground so this is just some uh, some smaller sized hemp rope and it's in various different lengths because I don't know how to tie knots very well and a lot of times I just cut them out. I have a small hand vise here. These are just super handy to have. You can uh, use them. It's just like having an extra pair of hands and we know that these were carried thanks to the research uh, again from uh, friend Nathan Kobuck um, where he's found a number of these uh, in, in a period of counts. Uh, where they were being carried and it makes perfect sense right if I need to repair a gun or something like that I might need an extra pair of hands to hold on to something while I work for it or while I work on it I also have a ladle and a bullet mold 54 caliber bullet mold and with some lead that I have I can melt that down or I can uh, retrieve musket balls for example from a shooting competition we may wind up doing this weekend and I can remelt those down for more bullets I have a housewife. This is a affectionate term for a sewing kit back then. And this just has needle thread, um, extra pins, extra pieces of linen and stuff for patching material. Hand sewn clothing back then, as exquisitely as some of it was made, just simply didn't last. After all, that's why we have sewing machines now. If hand sewing was that much superior, we would still be doing it. Um, and so you have to get comfortable with equipment wearing out and the constant state of maintenance that may be required, even when I'm out here for just a couple of days. I have a small fishing kit. This one's based on George Washington's fishing kit. It's got hooks, uh, some, some string, um, some weights, and then I have a small compass in here that I carry as well. Um, and two, two basic rules in life, always know where you are, and if you don't know where you are, try to look cool. And I carry all of this equipment in this knapsack. Now this is a very common style knapsack. There's an original that this is based on uh, right down to the uh, dimensions themselves. This has a couple of you know, chest or shoulder straps there. It's got a tie in the middle here, so it ties across the sternum, helps stabilize the load. There's no rigidity to this pack at all. Um, it's just a giant bag with three buttons, but it holds all this stuff beautifully. And we know they were documented. Now my role this weekend in this event is as a scout or a spy for the local militia. And as part of that persona, I've chosen some unique equipment um, that would be common for a scout or spy to have. I've got my tomahawk here in a leather sheath. I have my knife and waist belt. I have my shooting pouch. This is a, a buckskin, brain tan buckskin shooting pouch here. It's the one that I normally carry. I've got a little bit of extra patching material um, that's just kind of cut into a strip and I, I tie it to the strap of the bag itself. I've got a powder measure and a, a, a vent pick here for, for picking the hole in the vent to make sure it's clear. And in here I've just got uh, uh, some extra flints, a couple of tools for um, taking apart and maintenance of the gun itself um, and some extra patching material and cleaning material. Powder horn that I've selected for this weekend is a, a bison horn. 
Um, this is a, a fairly plain but very accurate bison horn with just a simple uh, woven wool strap. Now there is an original um, remaining from the Northeast that has a similarly woven wool strap that's attached to the horn itself with cordage. Very, very similar to this one. So I know this is accurate. This is wool tape that's actually dyed with matter root. So even the dye that I've used for this particular strap is accurate to the period, which means the color is accurate to the period. And I am going for all of those small details for both myself and my own experience and the experience of the others around me. Now, for the firearm itself, I'm carrying my standard 54 caliber uh, rifle, and I've got the cow's knee over the lock right now. The lock needs a little bit of work because it's, uh, it's been damp, so I've got a little bit of rust that I'll need to work on, um, and I've got some extra patching material and some patch grease here in the patch box itself. Um, now, a couple of notes about safety. Um, this is, again, this is, this is an immersion style event. This is supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be dangerous. And so always check with the site or the host of the event for exactly what they're comfortable with you carrying. For example, we're not going to have any live ammunition on us this weekend. Um, to, to be quite frank with you, no one cares how sorry you are when you shoot the wrong thing. So here's my equipment all put together and on my back. I'm really happy with the way this impression has turned out. Um, the weight's not too bad. All the different pieces of equipment interface well with one another. I feel like it's sustainable and I feel like it's going to be the vehicle that takes me back into time to the 18th century. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you following along with me and I hope it inspires you to find your own uh, rabbit to chase. And we'll see you next time on the Deerskin Diary.